live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Hey, all right, here we are again with another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay coming at you from San Antonio, Tejas. And today we're going to have a different kind of show than we're used to having around here, which is cool. We like to mix things up from time to time. With me is a new friend of mine. He's a cool guy. He's a fellow BMXer. His name is Jared Hanning, and he is from Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, Jared, welcome, man. Hello. Glad to be here. Moved from the uh, country Tejas myself to get here. Oh, well, we'll we'll forgive you for that. (laughs) Actually, South Carolina is a beautiful country, too. We have trees, rain, four seasons, lots of things I never discovered in West Texas. Yeah, sort of four seasons. (laughs) Not like the Northeast. True that. Yeah, it's beautiful there. I love South Carolina. I'm a big fan of it. Um, Jared is a performance coach at Mindset Performance. And I'm going to let you go ahead and tell this audience, Jared, what you specialize in real quickly, because I think it's so unique that you'll be able to put it much better than I will. Ah, it is crazy stuff, right? (laughs) So my clients normally double their income in the first year, and they do that by purposely working less hours. Like that's the gateway that gets them there. And I know that sounds like snake oil. Um, We use a Nobel nominated process that causes their brain to think at a higher level. And that's how all that is made possible. Um, but that, that's my work, um, leadership, productivity. And as a result of that, folks are making more money, having more fun and, uh, working way less hours. And you call that process mind scan. Uh, the, the tool, one of the tools that I use is the mind scan. The mind scan is usually the first tool that somebody gets access to just to show them what's possible. Um, and that it's just, like there's almost no barrier to entry because once you, once you take it, you find out for yourself, you're like, Oh my gosh, let's go. Um, but yeah, yeah. We usually start with a mind scan. And that obviously doesn't include some big scary machine at a hospital, right? Not at all. Not at all. The mind scan is unique. Um, and I mean, of the many reasons that it's Nobel nominated, normally when people think of like a place to start a measuring stick, a, an assessment or something like that, they start thinking of like a disc or Myers Briggs or something like that. And the thing with those tools, um, as fun as they are to talk about online or wherever you share your results is that they are personality comparisons. So you get your results and it says, Hey, you have these tendencies and these traits and 25% of the population is like that. That is information and it might be exciting information, but it's not information that actually moves the needle. Um, if you were to go to the doctor and the doctor says, okay, you have this and we have a 60% success rate with it. That's information. It's not helpful information. Helpful would be if we knew what side of the 60% line you were on. And that's what makes the mind scan different. It's a scientific measurement of your values. Consequently, it's not a questionnaire. You can't game it. Um, when you're spending the 10 or 15 minutes necessary to get the data that we use to give you your breakthrough, um, you have no idea how it's getting those answers. That, that's why it's Nobel nominated. Um, but the data is is pretty crucial. Like if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, I don't really know what's going on inside you. Why don't you take these pills and tell me what happens? You go to another doctor. When the doctor goes, I can't see what's going on inside you. Let's march you down the hallway, get an MRI, print up a picture. Now we know exactly what's going on. That's what the mind scan offers us. So when someone comes in and they're tired of not having the time they need to, to build the relationships or maybe to build themselves or the confidence or whatever they need, they're tired of not having the money that they need to invest in those systems and processes and coaching and level up their business so that they're starting to live what life is calling them to. When they're tired of hitting those hurdles, there are three things that they are already doing. Number one, they're doing everything that they know to do about it, right? Right. If you're listening to this podcast, I want you to go ahead and pat yourself on the back. You are not a slacker. You're out there hustling. You're doing everything you know to do to get more time, to get more money, to grow in your relationships and what life is calling you to. But every year, if you keep landing in the same place, 
Then number two is also true, which is everything that you're doing makes sense to do. It seems like a good idea. If you're having frustrations with your business, it seems like a good idea to work harder. It seems like a good idea to use a to-do list. It seems like a good idea to check things off, but it turns out that all three of those things actually reduce your income, they reduce your effectiveness, they reduce your power during the day. Um, we could talk about that later if you want to. But number three, what I want to get into is if you're working hard and you're doing everything that makes sense, what that means about your situation, your breakthrough, whether it's a breakthrough in relationship, a breakthrough with yourself, a breakthrough with your business, time or money, whatever it is, number three is that a breakthrough for your situation will at first not make sense. If it made sense for you to do, you'd already be doing it, right? And that's the dilemma. The brain cannot think of what it cannot understand. The mind scan gives us that access. It allows us to see where the wires have gotten crossed in your thinking patterns. Consequently, we can see where the blind spot is that's been tripping you up. And because of that, we know exactly where your breakthrough is. Now I want to talk a little bit about the importance of blind spots and breakthroughs. If you were um, driving your car and you accidentally backed into something, you don't step on the gas and try harder. No, you get out of the car because that physically shifts your vantage point. By physically shifting your vantage point, you see things you were not able to see before. The mind saying gives us that information for your relationships and your business. But there's another aspect about things that make sense to us and why what we think we should do is the same thing that keeps us stuck. When you were five years old and uh, you were just learning how to ride a bicycle, right? And uh, you're, you're a little scared, right? You didn't have it yet. Maybe you'd fallen down a couple times. Um, if you guys are listening to this podcast, I want you to think back to that time that you were just learning to ride a bicycle. You you knew it was possible. You'd seen other people do it. You were excited about it. But at the same time, you're a little afraid, right? Because it hurts. It sucks to fall. It's not fun. And maybe it's kind of scary. And we finally reached that stage where your folks take off the training wheels. And in this moment, you're doing all you know to do to try to figure this stupid bicycle thing out. And your crazy Aunt Jenny comes by with some advice. And crazy Aunt Jenny says, if you'll go faster, it's easier to balance. And in your little five-year-old brain, you're thinking, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Now I know why they call her crazy Aunt Jenny. Because if you couldn't balance going slow, then how is going faster going to work? That was a bad idea. It was irresponsible. It was dangerous. Crazy Aunt Jenny, leave me alone. I will figure this out on my own. And then one day... You accidentally found yourself going faster, and in that moment, you felt balance for the first time, and your brain went, oh my gosh, now I understand. And that is the dilemma of blind spots. What makes sense to us is actually what keeps the breakthrough away, which is why I went and work with my clients start with the mind scan. Well, that's fascinating. And it is with a certain amount of trepidation based on what you just said a couple minutes ago that I also think it makes sense. And I appreciate you describing all that because it certainly is foundational to everything you teach. For today's purposes, we're talking about how to be less busy, how to see your own blind spots, how to become more efficient. And we are also going to tie that together in terms of how that relates to being more attractive to women and helping our relationships. So, the first thing I want to bring up in that regard is you talk about being one thought away. Give us a little yes, bit sir. more insight on that. Yes, sir. One thought away. Right now, you're doing all you know to do. You're doing everything that makes sense. And everything that makes sense is also holding you up. Your breakthrough is simply a thought that you haven't had before. The problem is you're not able to access that thought on your own. It requires an outside influence. For example, if you have um, bad eyesight, you can't squint your way out of weak eyesight. You can't willpower your way out of it. Eyesight requires an external reference point, glasses, contacts, handrails, whatever. You, you can't willpower. It can't come from inside you. When you keep hitting the same obstacle year after year, 
don't have time to build relationships, uh, don't have money to get the time to build relationships, tried building relationships, but they keep ending up in the same place. When you keep hitting the same obstacle, it's not because you're a bad person. All it means is there's something about that particular situation that your brain hasn't seen yet. Thus, when it sees it, you are, in fact, one thought away from your next breakthrough. So plenty of us are listening to this thinking, okay, I probably have a blind spot or two here. But by definition, since they're a blind spot, I'm not going to be able to see it. What's the first thing we do to wake ourselves up to the need to be doing some of the things you're talking about, Jared? Wake yourself up. First, you hit the obstacle. Now, when we hit the obstacle, we don't have enough time. We don't have the money. You know, we, we're like, oh, man, I just don't have the time to work out. Oh, man, I just don't have the time to go out and meet new people. Oh, man, I just don't have the money to go to that seminar to train with that person. Whatever it is, we keep hitting the same obstacle. If you keep hitting the same obstacle, that's your first clue that a blind spot is tripping you up. And if a blind spot is tripping you up, no amount of willpower will get you out of it. Um, so what usually happens is we get to the end of the year and we're like, oh man, this is stupid. I mean, I didn't, I didn't work out. I promised myself to do that. I didn't meet new people. I promised myself I'd do that. You know, I said, finally, this is the year that I'm going to take that social risk and get out there. Okay. Tell you what, next year I'm really going to apply myself. Okay. So then next year goes around and you go, ah, oh, man. Okay. No, this year wasn't, it wasn't a fair example. I mean, you know, I got sick in the summer and then like, you know, I had to go visit my, my mom and then we had that funeral. This wasn't a good year. I'm calling a mulligan. We're doing a do over next year. I'm really, really going to apply myself. If you said that more than three years, we need to take a look at what's going on inside your mind because what's making sense is this fact getting in the way. So one of the things you're talking about here is figuring out something that isn't going to make sense to your own mind, but needs to be done. The mind scan obviously is a process that helps us uncover that. What can these guys do who are listening right now to start reframing their mind a little bit to say, okay, look, if I'm spending too much time on something, as you said, maybe that's the worst way to do it instead of the best way to do it. How do we start wrapping our heads around the fact that less is more in terms of time spent versus results expected? Okay. So if, if we're in the, like the time money situation, um, some quotes. And if you guys are podcast, you know, I would encourage you to re-listen to this if you're driving on the road so you can write this quote down. But one quote I want you to have up on your wall is if I'm doing the work, my business is falling behind. Um, if you're doing the work, whether you're a landscaper or a framer, if you're like working with your hands, whether you're a manager or a CEO and you're, you're de dealing with people, whatever it is, if you're doing the work, you're in fact falling farther and farther behind. Um, let's take uh, some physical trades, carpentry, plumbing, landscaping, whatever. Um, if you are at the client's house helping them solve that construction problem, who's getting supplies? Who's taking care of marketing? Um, who's doing your accounting? Who's doing customer service? Who's lining up new jobs? Who's training your helpers? Who's doing maintenance on the vehicle? I mean, you just simply can't wear all the hats at one time. And as long as you're wearing one of the hats, the other hats are going without. And you cannot outwork that. You can't solve a bad strategy with stubbornness. So here's what you do. You start your day with planning and building systems. Okay. What are the core things that I need for this task? What are the core things I need for that task? What are the core things I need for that task? The next day you start lining up and planning and drafting people that can help with that. The next day you start to partner the plans and the systems and the people together because your job as a leader is not to do the work, but to cause the work to go forth. If you're doing the work, you're actually getting in the way of the people that need to be doing it. Now you might say to yourself, ah, oh, man, see, I know this is true. I know this. I've heard this before. I know I need to delegate. I know I would delegate if I had the money. I would delegate if I had the time. I know, I know, I know I need to, but the, the reason I haven't delegated is because cut it out. Here's how you solve that. In your line of work, there is one thing that makes it rain. I don't know what that is, but when you put your finger on what makes it rain in your line of work, whether it's cold calls, whether it's snail mail, whether it's uh, digital marketing funnels, whether it's speaking at conferences, whatever it is that makes it rain, 
That is the single most important task of your whole day. Now, here's what we usually do. We wake up and it's very clear in our heart what the life is calling us to. We know we have got to whatever, have that hard conversation, make the cold calls, whatever it is. And we say to ourselves, man, this is so important. I'm going to clear a space in my day when I can really focus on that because it's so important. I really need to focus on it. So we get our to-do list and what do we do? We spend the next part of our day doing $10 an hour tasks that somebody else could be doing. You cannot outwork a bad strategy. We get to three, four o'clock in the afternoon. We're like, ah, man, my day slipped away from me. Tell you what, tomorrow I'm going to double down. I'm really going to focus on what I need to do. The most important tax. No, no, no. Start your day with a $500 an hour task. If you will start your day with what makes it rain, it won't be very many days before you have all the money you need to outsource the other tasks. But if you start your day with the $10 an hour tasks, you will never get to the $500 an hour task. I've heard you say before, Jared, that if you're doing a $10 task, suddenly you're worth $10 an hour. That's how much you're making. You're making that money you're spending in that hour. Because if you were doing that which you were uniquely able to do that made it rain, as you say, you would be making that $500 an hour. So what makes more sense letting someone else get paid to do that $10 an hour so you can go make $500 an hour to a net tune of $490 or to keep being stubborn and doing it all yourself, right? Yeah, but that's the trap because uh, people say, ah, oh, but I just don't have the money, so I have to do the $10 an hour. Oh, but I don't have someone to delegate, so I have to do it. But you can't outwork a bad strategy with stubbornness. You have to start with a $500 hour task. And after that, I don't care if you do that for 15 minutes in the morning. Fine. By the end of the week, you've got an extra 500 bucks in your pocket. I think that's fair enough. I think a lot of people might be saying to themselves that, well, I don't have a $500 an hour product that I can put out on the market yet. And I'm scratching for that $10 to outsource. So why not get my foundation built till I'm to that point? I mean, what would you say to that guy? Um... I would say if you don't know what the $500 hour task is, follow me. Other podcasts, social media, Facebook, tons of free content out there. And, and you could just start getting started. I've got plenty of exercises out there that allow you to find out how to get your task. Um, okay, so hardcore examples here. Um, let's say you are a realtor and your task as a realtor actually your license by the state task is to oversee the paperwork of the transaction to make sure everything is checked and lined up and all that stuff. And that's not something you can delegate to somebody else because it is your state licensed responsibility. The only person you can delegate it to is somebody who also has that license. Well, if you are the one filling out the paperwork, who's out there, bringing in new clients, who's taking care of the existing clients, who's handling the customer service, who's doing the account, right? It doesn't matter if you're a painter and you're amazingly talented and people pay oodles and oodles of noodles for your work. If you're doing the work, who is marketing, who is selling, who's handling customer service, who's you, you just can't your job as a leader, as a business owner, is to build systems and to build people. And when you spend your time on systems and people, things that scale, then the less you work, the more you make. Or another way to look at that, the more you work, meaning as the days go by, you find yourself with more and more free time. If what you're finding yourself with as the days go by is more and more work to do, then we've got a bad strategy. we got to rewire that. A little bit more practical example for realtors is... Sometimes real, realtors are like, yeah, man, I just, I just don't have enough work coming in to bring on another licensed agent to handle that stuff. Okay. And why don't you have enough work coming in? Because you're spending your day on the licensed activities. You have to start your day with what makes it rain. Whether it's cold calling for you, whether it's uh, networking for you or lunches or chamber of commerce events or postcards or social media posts, whatever that is, you have to start your day with what makes the money. Well, I appreciate those examples because I think it makes it a little bit more tangible in the minds of the guys listening. And I particularly like your example about the painter because a painter could imply someone who paints the inside or outside of homes 
or it could imply someone who creates unique, beautiful, and valuable works of art. If you're the former, then you can get people paid by the hour to paint the inside of the homes while you make television commercials or make it rain, however you can uniquely do that. If you're the kind of painter who's more of an artist, then mm -hmm. you uniquely have to craft your own works of art. You have to make it rain by making more works of art. Someone else can be hired to do the marketing or create schedules to show at galleries or whatever. But of course, I'm sure there's some kind of mix in there, depending on where you are in your painting career, where you have to make unique appearances as the artist himself, build those relationships firsthand. Whatever it is that you do uniquely to make it rain is indeed going to depend on what it is you're so good at and what you're uniquely good at, correct? Um, that's a distinction that I would make. Um, I like the example of the, the high end artist, the painter, uh, the sculptor, the potter, whatever the, the fine art creator is, uh, that fine art creation might be their genius. It might be their brand. It might be their talent, but that is not what makes it rain without a demand for their product. There is, there's no sense in making the product. And making more product isn't what creates the demand. It's those TV interviews and radio interviews and social presence and, and interviews and standing next to other people and being out. That's what makes it rain. Now, it's true. You can hire an agent. You can hire somebody to spend their day making the 100 calls a day, booking those appointments. You can hire a rainmaker. You can hire a marketer. That is absolutely true. The challenge many people find themselves in, that hamster wheel, if you will, is that they feel like they can't afford to hire the marketer or the rainmaker. So they're trying to do all the work themselves. They're trying to market, they're trying to rain make, and they're trying to produce the fine art. The solution to that rat race is to start your day with what makes it rain, i.e. what creates the demand for your products and services. End your day with the products and services themselves. So it's a matter of prioritizing your calendar to yes. prioritize your mind. Yes, yes. Without making it rain, there is no money to outsource. You're stuck. Well, just to be clear, though, we're talking about the guy who's a painter. No one else is going to be able to create his work of art uniquely or else they'd be a counterfeiter. True. Right. So that person has to uniquely create the works of art. If the demand is created, I mean, there's always going to be that fine line of flooding the market versus having that work of art be rare and valuable. I mean, there's what, seven Da Vinci paintings, <laughs> you know? Right. So I understand that piece of it, but how does a person who is in that kind of position saying to themselves, well, wait a minute, there's like six different things that I have to do. If I have to do the marketing, if I have to be the one who does the appearances, if I have to be the one who does all the television, if I have to be the one who goes and presses the flesh with all the owners of all these different galleries, then when do I freaking get the time to paint? I'm back to being on that hamster wheel and I'm back to being stuck in that rat race where I don't have any free time anymore. If I feel like I'm the one who uniquely has to do six or eight or 10 different things, how can I actually realistically sort out in my mind that I'm being arrogant in some of these places? In other words, yes, you uh, know what? There could yeah. be someone else who could do this. I'm kidding myself if I think I'm the only person who could really do that because I think that's the insidious angle that starts bringing people back full circle to that point where they go, yeah, you know what, Jared, I tried, but you know what? I really do have to do all this myself. Everybody else just screws it up and I get nowhere. Um, okay. A, a couple, a couple examples that we certainly could mention there. Um, in, in the painter example though, if the painting itself is that painter's brand, and we could certainly look at examples because it will blow your mind the um, level of talent that gets delegated and outsourced regularly. But let's just say that it is, in fact, only that one person is allowed to make the art um, because that's, that's their business. And, and the marketing is what they outsource. But if they're in a position where they don't have enough money or they don't have enough time to create the art, you know, they don't have enough money to hire a marketing agency. They don't have enough time to train an assistant. They don't have enough time to market and do that. If they're in that situation, the solution is to start their day, make a few cold calls that day. The next day, I go to a networking event. The next day, write an article for the newspaper. Start your day with that. After that, then you can get to the core activities. So after that, they would go to work creating another painting.
Well, I mean, I'm thinking of examples as you're talking. Here in Texas, there was a craftsman who started out making silver jewelry. His name was James Avery. He just yep. recently passed away in his 90s. You know, he made very little jewelry himself by hand in recent years or even recent decades. Correct. He's got too many stores with too many products in any of these stores spread out all over Central and South Texas for the one man to have possibly created all that jewelry. So there are craftsmen who have been hired by him personally to recreate the designs he came up with. He still designs all of them. Yes. They still have his name on them, but he's not handcrafting each piece of jewelry. That would be a great example of thinking out of the box to find ways where you could get somebody to do your thing as opposed to you uniquely having to do it all. And I'm thinking also of people who are like teachers and coaches. You know, you can have a team of people trained and licensed to perform your specific way of doing things, your system, your methodology, mm -hmm. your modality. Yep. Um, and I think a lot of times people don't trust other people to do those things lest they not be done as well. In other words, we lack trust in terms of delegating things out to other people and outsourcing them. I mean, it's easy when you're outsourcing something you have no idea how to do, like create this incredible whiz bang video intro or code a website, you know. That's easy. We know what we're not able to do. And as a matter of fact, some people still struggle with outsourcing that, I've noticed. I'm raising my hand back in the days. <laughs> but when you say to yourself, no way, man, this is my gig. This is my jam. This is what I do. How do you gain the humility necessary to say, okay, you know what? I've got to let this go. As much as it's going to hurt psychologically, I've got to hand this off. And then how do you know whether that was a mistake or not once you did it? How much rope do you give these people to hang themselves with? Same way you learn how to ride a bicycle. Your brain did not understand that going faster made it easier to balance until you personally went faster. No amount of information made a difference. No amount of explanation, no amount of demonstration from somebody else, no amount of your crazy aunt Jenny telling you, no, no, I'm serious. You really, need it didn't matter. Didn't make a hill of beans difference until you personally experienced it. Nothing mattered after you personally experienced it. No more information was needed. So in other words, try it. You'll like it. Try it. Come back. Let me know. You cannot steer a parked vehicle. The wheels have got to be moving. If some guy is uh, frustrated with his dating, no amount of information, no amount of YouTube videos, no amount of books or seminars or courses or none of that makes a hill of beans difference until he actually goes out and opens his mouth and talks to people. Like well, it isn't that just doesn't make a difference. Oh, yeah. We have a bunch of keyboard jockeys, guys who would love to get all the books, watch all the videos, listen to all the podcasts, and think they're doing something about getting a great woman into their life. But you know what? That's not the same as actually going out and making it happen. And on that note, what would you tell guys who are maybe making excuses for going out and finding a girlfriend, strengthening and deepening a relationship they have with a certain girl or woman out there? Because they say, I don't have the time. I've got other priorities. Things are just too busy for me right now. Is that fear? Or is that something where they need to do exactly the process you're talking about to even handle that part of their life? Um, some of those people I, I can't help because they haven't been honest with themselves yet. They say they want something that they really don't. Some of those Fair people, enough. they want something, but they're afraid. Got it. I can fix that. You're afraid, we can fix that, done. You don't know what to do, we can fix that, done. But if you want it, you say you want it, but you really don't, I can't fix that. Um, so, so for some of the folks, this statement will make a difference. Um, how much more of your life are you willing to spend on something you don't like? Um, we realize like sex is not something you save up for your old age. Money is not something you save up for your old age. Time is not something you save up for your old age. Now, the only reason we don't have the sex we want or the time we want or the money we want now is because we have valued comfort over results. Some people value reasons over results. In life, you either have what you want or you have the reasons why you don't want it. Now, some guys are like, I'm sick of it. I am not willing to spend another day of my life living this way, but I don't know what to do. Got it. We can fix that. But I'm afraid of what to do. Got it. We can fix that. Well, first of all, I would argue that there's very little, if anything, in this life we should be saving up for old age. 
maybe our health, but we should be healthy now too. <laughs> you know, it's like what Tim Ferriss calls the deferred life plan. Here's everything I'm going to do after I retire at age 65 or is that 68 or is that 72? It's creeping up. World travel. I mean, you're going to go explore the unrestored part of the Great Wall of China and go on a trek in the Sahara Desert when you're 75. I mean, you're much better off doing that now while you have some youth and some strength. Um, so I agree with that wholeheartedly. What I want to address is the guy who's out there saying, Jared, you know what, man, you don't get it. I'm like doing my residency for my medical profession here where I'm working 120 hours a week to get this business off the ground because otherwise it's just not going to happen. And I understand what you're going to say to that. But all these guys out there saying, I have got to be focused on these things that have to happen or else my job, my career, my business isn't going to succeed. I don't have time to go out on dates, seeing if this woman and I are going to get along or not. But then again, you know what? I'm going to wake up someday, 75, and I'm alone, and I'm never going to have had a great woman in my life, and I'm never going to have had children. And I just don't know where to find that balance. What is the mindset tweak that that guy can make to say, hey, you know what? I'm not really in need of having to do all these busy things. Maybe it matters as much for me to make time to get better acquainted with this particular woman, to find a new woman, heck, to go to the gym and get in better shape, you know, to actually eat a healthy meal instead of going and buying something prepackaged and fast again. All these decisions matter. It almost reminds me of the four quadrant theory where certain things are urgent but not important, and there are other things that are important but non-urgent, and you've got to make time for the things that are important, but not necessarily burning a hole in your life right now. And that has to come at the expense of the things that seem like they're nagging you to get done right away, but really aren't important at all, like hanging out on Twitter or watching ESPN or something like that. How do you get a guy to tweak that mindset and set that alarm off in his mind? Um, if there's no pain, uh, there's, there's no change. I agree with that. You know, if, if he's comfortable with that, then uh, I'm sorry, we, we can't help. Uh, if he's happy with his reasons, if he's happy with being right about all the reasons why he can't or should not or it's in the right time or fine, you can have reasons or results. If you want, want results, we'll make it happen. If you want reasons, I hope to keep you warm at night. I mean, you, you just got to choose residency. I get it. It's super, super, super busy. And you can say to yourself, ah, I have to finish this 10 years of busyness before I can um, do family and social and things that really matter in life. Great. Do you know how many people in residency meet their spouse in residency? If you want to be right about why you can't, great, you can have that. If you want to be right about why you can, bam, you can have that too. Business, oh gee, I have to spend this 100 hours a week working on this business so I can support my family. After that, then I'll spend time with my kids. You want to be right about that? Great. You can miss 10 years of your kid's life. Or if you want to be right about how you can have it all, you can be right about that, too. That's the power of your brain. People also are hearing voices like Gary Vaynerchuk out there going, you know, stop being a wuss. Put your nose to the grindstone. Bury yourself for the next four years of your life hustling to get this business done and then live the dream after that. But what I hear you saying is, you know, it isn't simply the hustling. Maybe you could spend the next six months doing the right things and have a great life after that. Maybe the four years isn't the problem. It's getting your own stuff done uniquely and, and sorting out the busyness so that you can sort out your business. So I hear what you're saying. Yes, I have to want this, but I also have to want it for the right reasons. And I have to be as efficient as I can by outsourcing those things that I'm not necessarily uniquely able to do and focusing on those things that make it rain. Then I get to my position sooner than later. And voila, I'm having much more free time to meet the woman of my dreams, to hang out with my kids, to go on an international vacation that I've always wanted to do. Otherwise, I think the bottom line here is how the American dream has been spoiled for a lot of people or, you know, perverted for a lot of people. And I'm going to go ahead and say that is that it's the hard work. It's the time. It's the pain. It's the idea of living for the weekends that we hold in high esteem not really the freedom that we're supposedly trying to get from doing all those wonderful things. I think a lot of people really are a slave to whatever their mindset is rather than experiencing that real freedom. So I appreciate everything you're saying today. And what I want to do is I want to give these guys a chance to check out what you call 
the mind scan and learn more about you and your work. And to do that, I'm going to send them to a special URL, which I always do. That website is www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash mindset, M-I-N-D-S-E-T, one word. And Jared, what are guys going to find when they go to that link? I've got a set of case studies that uh, I want to share with them. If, if you're tired of not having the time to meet new people, if you're tired of meeting new people but not having the money to really you know, show them what's possible with the two of you together, if you're tired of not having the money for your, you know, yourself and your health, if that's it, you're tired of getting to the same place every year, I want to share with you three case studies. Um, these are things that my clients have done to double their income by purposely working less hours. Um, in this little case study reveal here, I've got snippets of their mind scans so you can see exactly what was going on in their thinking patterns and see why that was the key to a breakthrough for their unique situation. So we'll look at those three case studies and go ahead, like swipe that stuff, steal it, start putting that stuff to work in your business and see the difference that it makes for you. Outstanding stuff, Jared. And once again, guys, if you want to go check that out, and I think you should, go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash mindset. And guys, if you're not on my newsletter yet, I know I say this every show, some of you still aren't. Go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com and get you some. I will send you unique, valuable, actionable ways you can get better with women, be the kind of men you've always wanted to be, even get ahead in your business and in life. Every day, something real, not just fluffy stuff, but real stuff every day for free to your inbox. Go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com and check it out. As you also know, the new relationship program is out. It's called Get Together, Stay Together, and that can be checked out at gettogetherstaytogether.com. Also at onlinedatingdomination.com, version 3.0 of the online dating program that contains the legendary projection profile is out and about. Some of you guys already have version 1 or version 2 of online dating domination. Just go to the members portal and you have been automatically upgraded. And if you don't have the program yet, simply go to www.onlinedatingdomination and give it a try. You'll be thrilled with the number of women you're meeting almost effortlessly. I'm giving you all the ways that you can really beat the system to make online dating apps and online dating sites work for you instead of vice versa for a change. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from San Antonio, Texas for X and Y Communications. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for The Mountaintop Podcast.